Welcome to Damsels in Dialogue, a podcast dedicated to female protagonists in fiction, film, and the stage. Co-hosted by India Marie Paul and Katie Zutter. For our inaugural season, we will be focusing on eight animated heroines from Walt Disney feature films. This episode, we travel back to 15th century Paris and follow the journey of a talented goat and a street performer who has entranced readers and audiences since 1831, known simply as La Esmeralda. Okay, so today we are talking about the hunchback of Notre Dame and our female protagonist is Esmeralda. Ah, big fan. The movie itself is actually my favorite Disney movie. One of my favorite movies of all time. I really, really love it. So I'm very partial (laughs) to this character. I'll try to be objective (laughs) about it. Because it is different watching it as an adult. Oh, it absolutely. Is. When it came out in 96, I'm going to age myself, I was three or four. So it definitely was something that I didn't really understand, but I knew that I liked when I was younger and I dressed up as Esmeralda for Halloween. I guess you did. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I did. And so it's something that I've continued to love. And the more I learned about theater, the more I actually loved it because the score is so good. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I just... No, it's, so, yeah. good. So, it's good. so good. So good. So let's start with its origins. So Esmeralda is a fictitious character in Victor Hugo's novel Notre Dame de Paris, which is Notre Dame of Paris. And it was published in 1831. So something that's really cool about this novel in particular is that it was in a time when Notre Dame was actually crumbling. It's set in the 15th century, specifically in 1482. And when Hugo was writing in the 1820s, he actually came out with a pamphlet that was writing to try and save Notre Dame. Because it was in such a state of disrepair that there was talk of demolishing it. And that's insane (laughs) to think about now. It's crazy. It's such a symbol. And I really think that this novel made it, it gave it this legacy that I don't know that it would be the Notre Dame we know today. Mm -hmm. without it because what happened was he wrote this novel it was widely popular it got translated into so many different languages it became the hunchback of notre dame when it was english translated so i believe it i think it got translated in 1833 so this is only two years after it was published it got translated into english became the hunchback of notre dame which we know and what happened was he wrote this book kind of as a love letter to notre dame and to paris like what paris was He spends chapters talking about the beauty of medieval Paris and Notre Dame itself. The novel was so popular that it actually did help start a restoration effort in 1844. So, I, yeah, I'll try to keep all of my fun facts to like a minimum because I have so many <laughs> on this because I just love it so much. And Esmeralda is such an interesting character because she is definitely an object in the in the novel yeah as in the movie though i do think disney did a pretty decent transfer job so we'll talk about that i agree in the novel she was 16 years old the novel opens in the feast of fools much like the movie and the feast of fools was a real thing it was kind of celebrated in different ways in different places they select a false bishop or pope for the king of fools which is what they have in the movie and it was celebrated in the middle ages around january 1st so this they put it as January 6th, I believe, in the movie. So we start off there. We have we got introduced to Esmeralda. Not right away. It takes a little bit in the book to get us introduced to people. But it immediately turns her into this angelic, beautiful dancer that everyone instantly falls in love with. She's described so much with angel imagery and purity and talked about her modesty because she's written as a virgin. Mm. And it's like a plot point that she's a virgin. Wh- which is... Which is very, <laughs> there's a chapter in there where Frollo ends up professing his love to her and it, I, it, I cringed for the half hour I was listening to it. But you follow all these characters that you don't actually get to meet in Disney's movie and you kind of follow along with a poet named Gringoire who ends up being Esmeralda's husbands for four years. It's, it's a weird, but they never for consummate the marriage. four like, years? Yes. So. <laughs> what? The. Okay, so you meet Esmeralda. She's this beautiful dancer. She's described, she's known as La Esmeralda, like the Esmeralda. And in Spanish, it transfers to the Emerald, but they never really talk about that in the novel. 
they um, they introduce her like that in the movie too they do yeah he says la esmeralda dance yeah yeah um it's a very specific she she gets asked in the book like why are you called that she's like i don't really know she's just very very young very naive very pure character yeah she has in, grown up since then yes like, <laughs> we'll get it's, there but <laughs> yeah it's yeah disney just makes her like an adult <laughs> and the novel really makes her this picturesque young innocent youth so we learn that she actually is not roma or a gypsy we learn that in the book she was stolen from a french woman by the the gypsy clan and replaced with quasimodo in her place of her mother who she was stolen from so her real name is agnes (laughs) just very interesting that they Mm -hmm. make this pure innocent young Mm -hmm. child Mm -hmm. specifically not of that that's that's a little that's a little that's a little fishy it's It's yeah it's a little fishy and why it it bothers me is because and we'll talk i want to talk a little bit about like the word gypsy because it's starting to come out how we're not it can be a very offensive word to certain romani people and it was used as a slur it was used as Mm -hmm. a slur against the roma people in europe and it's constantly used in this book and he describes romani women in this book i wrote this one down So Hugo oh describes dear. them as the Roma women are still uglier than the men. Their faces were darker and always uncovered. They wore a sorry kirtle about their body, an old cloth woman with cords bound upon their shoulder and their hair hanging like a horse's tail. So that's how that's one of his description. Excuse uh, you, sir. What? Yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of the stereotypes towards Roma's or the vagabonds that they're thieves that they're dirty that they're not trustworthy Man. there's a someone says that they eat children like there's all of these really horrible stereotypes thrown Gosh. at this you know group of people there's a huge history behind the slur of the gypsy name and i got so bothered yeah. By the fact that Esmeralda is seen as a very, be- like, the most beautiful woman in the world. That's kind of how she's described. She's, like, the perfect imagery of a woman. And at first, when I when I learned that, before I really read the book, it seemed that he was writing a character that broke the stereotype of Romani people. But then he specifically wrote that she wasn't Roma that she was a French infant who was taken. So he wouldn't even let the most beautiful girl in the world be Romani. She had to have an excuse of why she was, you know, it just felt. But then made the the main character who is described as hideous and a monster. Mm hmm. Yeah. Made, made him of that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, 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 there's still a lot of issues with Hugo's portrayal of her. There's a lot yeah. of sexual objectification of Esmeralda, just like every man is lustful after her and is trying to get her. And Frollo is just this... Frollo is an archdeacon in the novel instead of a judge. So I think that was one of the big differences I noticed in the movie because I read some article or interview that they made it so that they wouldn't be commentating on churches, that he was a Hmm. judge. He was not an archdeacon. Which I get. And I do. Yeah, I, yeah. When I learned that, I do see that a lot where they're trying to not play any certain religious theme. There are imagery right. like demons and angels and hell and heaven and all that is in the, the lyrics and in the movie, but they're not mm-hmm. trying to play it up nearly as much as the novel. He was an archdeacon who liked alchemy. Right. So it was it's a very odd, like hypocritical thing that he mm-hmm. did. He built these really horrible characters, Phoebus in the book is just a womanizer is engaged oh, that's, so, that's so sad so to hear because like he's so good in the mm-hmm. in the disney movie so okay so so more yeah. about not nice phoebus not nice phoebus <laughs> so <laughs> not nice phoebus <laughs> is the captain of the archers and he comes back from the war so that's true so yeah that checks out yeah he's engaged to a french woman named fleur de lis fleur de lis yeah. like fleur de lis Mm-hmm. You know, All right. Fleur de Lis. Yeah, that's your name, Fleur de Lis. <laughs> and he sees Esmeralda. He does save her. And Esmeralda does 
obsessively love Phoebus in the novel unhealthily. So I'm trying to get all these things straight because so many things get mushed together in the movie that happened. And so the Court of Miracles oh, yes, trial yes. that happens with Quasi and Phoebus actually happens to Gringoire, who's a poet that we follow at the beginning. It doesn't oh. happen to Phoebus and Quasi at all. Oh, oh, oh. And going back to she's married for four years. So <sighs> basically Gringoire is following Esmeralda and he doesn't really know why he just... He's kind of entranced by her and is looking for a place to stay that night. So he follows her after her performance in the square. Yeah, it's very creepy. Like, like follows her home? Like, follows her, yeah, home. What? First, he, Esmeralda gets attacked by who we learned to be Frollo and Quasi. Because Frollo lusted after her after seeing oh. her dance <laughs> and wanted <laughs> wanted her. Great, great, So great. Quasi is very much Frollo's servant. He's not locked up in the Notre Dame at all. He can come and go oh. as he wants, but he prefers the solitude because of his deformedness right, that he right. frightens people. So they attack Esmeralda and she fights back. And then Gringoire comes upon it because he's following her creepily. Yells for help because he's, you know, a poet who isn't known for strength. Right. And the guards come and Phoebus saves her from Quasimodo because Frollo flees. Esmeralda also mm-hmm. checks out. He yep. is yep. very cowardly. Dirt. Yep. <laughs> Esmeralda instantly falls in love with Phoebus because of his act of kindness, which is saving her from the attackers. In the way that a 16-year-old girl uh, yes. falls instantly uh-huh. in love with, mm-hmm, with a boy the hero who looks nice. and looks nice. <laughs> she gets freed. They take Quasi in for a trial because he attacked her. And Gringoire continues to follow her to the Court of Miracles, wherein he gets discovered and Clopin shows up and puts him on trial because he has discovered their hideout. Right. So, Understandably so. <laughs> so, you know, so he he gets the trial that they initially put in the film for Phoebus and Quasi. Okay. But then he said, there's only one way for you not to get hanged is if one of the women wants to marry you. So everyone says no. <laughs> Like yeah, because that's weird. People, well, people come up and check him out and they're like, no, you don't have any money. You're a poor poet. And like, walk away. <laughs> so, Ouch, you know, dude. Yeah. yeah, there's some of that. And then Esmeralda comes upon what was happening and sees that it's the guy who helped call for help to save her. So she's like, okay, I'll save him from the gallows. They throw a clay pot and it breaks into four pieces. So he's her husband for four years. Ah. Oh, so it's it's like, yeah, okay, okay. It's yeah. like a deal. So, it, it, yeah, it's it like a deal that okay. he won't hang Still strange, and he, he'll but... become, yeah, he'll become part of the the vagabond mm-hmm. troop for four years as her as her husband. He thinks all of a sudden, like, oh, maybe she actually likes me. So he tries to be like, do you want to, you know, because we're married now. And she gets out a knife and Jolly protects her when he tries to, like, put his hand on her waist. <laughs> and it's like, no. Can't do that. This is, this is a business deal, <laughs> sir. Yeah, it's very much like, what do you... She's kind of like, what do you think's happening? Because it's not that. <laughs> and I will say she does stand up for herself okay, in good. the book. That's really good. So she is written as kind of a character who does stand up for herself as much as she good. can. Yeah, because Disney really builds upon that. Yeah, and I, it, it definitely is within the book as much as she good. is objectified and right. all of that. And she explains that she has to stay a virgin because she has an amulet, which you see in the movie, but it's not this. It's very different, but they take it from this. She has an amulet that's a charm that if she stays pure, it will help her find her original family. Oh, Wants to stay pure and chaste so that she can find her parents. Right. Okay. So good. Yeah. An interesting um, motivator. And yeah, valid, I would think. Well, yeah, you it's just a, it's something parents. added in to make her this innocent. She is making choices for herself, which I find really. Yeah. Yeah. Give, giving her a little bit of personality and not bit, just yes. morals, you know, things yeah. like that. Not just her. Being, yeah. OK. OK, Victor. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you for at least a little bit of that. Well, yeah. And she does pull a dagger on him when he tries to touch her waist. You know, like there is some of that in there. We love that. Um, we love to see it. Yes. <laughs> And so that happened and he's like, cool, I won't try to do anything. The poet's like, okay, it's not that, then I'm not going to force you. Right. Which is, you know, okay. there's that. Good. So that's kind of the initial introduction to her. She, has, she still has Jolly, her goat, who knows tricks. So people also think she's a 
<laughs> the goat's a sorceress, too, because <laughs> she can count on the tambourine what time of day it is. So that's... They both get tried to be, you know... A witchery! They, yeah, they both get tried for being a witch and... No. Yeah, they both do. <laughs> oh! Yeah. So... <laughs> Viva saves her in her conversation with Gringua. She reveals that she's in love with Phoebus and says a man had a man like she explains what she believes a man is. She says a man has a helmet on his head, a sword in his hand and golden spurs on his heels. So that's Esmeralda's version of a man of like the like her dream man, her dream like, man. Like oh, what, ah. what makes a man is that does sound very much like what a man thinks a woman wants in a man. Yes. I mean, not that that's those are bad qualities. It's just no. It's very, very yeah, stereotypical. It's a little, mm-hmm. There's a little bit of the stereotyping. God, there's so many things that happen in this. <laughs> so yeah, I was just try, I'm trying to like give the Esmeralda run through in as clear of a way. I will be very scattered today. That's <laughs> okay. just everywhere. Quasi does get put on trial for attacking her and gets sentenced to a couple different kinds of torture and one of being where he gets put on that wheel or in those mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he has to be exposed to the crowd who yells at him and jeers at him. Okay, okay. He's deaf in the book. We got that from. He's He's, deaf in the book. He's deaf in the book and Frollo actually does raise him because he finds Quasi is left on the foundling's cradle, which is like a wooden cradle for unwanted kids. Yeah. So Esmeralda's mom, after she discovers this baby in the place of her beautiful daughter, takes him to the foundling's place and Frollo adopts Quasi because he believes it would be a good deed that invests in his future with the Lord. Ah. So he does, he's not guilted ah. into it. He doesn't kill a gypsy on the steps. No, this is this is yeah. also a business transaction. Yeah, it's very much thinking that, oh, I'm going to do this because it will be a will good deed. Me. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And he does it thinking about his brother because he loves his brother, who's kind of like a jerk scholar. It's it's a whole thing. So quasi. Yes. Lots of lots of interesting family drama in that <laughs> in that. So Quasi is put on trial, gets jeered at, people throw things at him, the whole thing. It's like, it's really cruel, but he did, you know, attack. Does step in or no? She does. So that, Ooh. that is more powerful in the book than in the movie, which is still a touching moment. Oh, of course. And Frollo does come up and recognize that Quasi is the one, you know, because he got Quasi to do it. Right. And he looks at who it is and then walks away. Instead of giving him water because he asked Quasi's asking for a drink. He can't really hear what people are yelling at him, but he can see the faces. Right, right. He's taking all that. He asks for a drink and then Esmeralda does show up and give him water. She's yeah. still frightened by him, but it's more powerful in the book because he's on trial for attacking her. Right, right. And she sees that he needs, she takes pity on him and the crowd kind of falls silent and she... Mm -hmm. gives him water and it's this really beautiful moment quasimodo instantly becomes someone who will protect her later because he kind of disappears for a while after that mm -hmm. in the book he doesn't really show up to the last third and that's what kind of the okay. movie really digs into focuses on yeah. yeah but it's this powerful scene where you have two people outcasted and hated by the world helping each other and her forgiving him or at least yeah. knowing that he shouldn't be treated as cruelly as he was for doing the right. thing that he did to her. So it's a it's a it's a big moment for her to to do that in the midst yeah. of a crowd throwing things at someone. So it's you know, that that was for in the hurting book. you. Like, yeah, it's a very, very brave of her. <laughs> yeah, it's a really big moment. And it actually I found more Im impactful in the novel than in the movie because it was yeah. for that. It wasn't just that people in general we're being we're, mean to him. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. So that happens. Phoebus ends up seeing her again and then gets her to meet him at a motel to do it because she loves him so much that so she's going to break the amulet. No, charm. no, yeah. no. But along the way. I hate that. What? Yeah. She clearly is making this huge decision and he and is he's written. just prom nighting her? Yeah, very much so because he's still engaged. Like he's engaged. It's not broken. The whole thing. It's very sad because Phoebus was one of my favorite characters growing up to oh, learn this. Excellent in the movie. Yeah. Like, yeah. geez. Okay. Well, anyway. <laughs> so what's what's creepier. Oh, no, 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 no. What's creepier is that 
So he's drunk with Frollo's brother at a bar and Venus? needs money. Yes. So he's drunk at a tavern. We find him at a tavern with Frollo's brother drunk and realizing that he needs money to pay for the hotel room where he's meeting her tonight. Frollo's been stalking Phoebus because he knows Esmeralda's in love with Phoebus, so he's jealous and wants to hurt Phoebus. Oh no, oh no. Phoebus realizes he's being followed, and Frollo gives him the money for the room if he can prove that it's Esmeralda he's meeting. So he hides in the closet <laughs> of the hotel room so that he can, like, it can be seen that in exchange for the, the payment for he the room... <gasps> And she comes in and you have this scene that's really hard to listen to because she's completely in love with him and he's just trying to, you know, to get her in bed. And she's having some internal strife. And he I think he says the words, I guess you don't love me because she wants to marry. She wants to be married. Right, right. But to him. So so he does that to her. And she and then she said, "Okay, I do love you. I'll do whatever you want. I'll be your mistress. I'll be your like, it's. Yeah. So there's that. So they start kissing and are getting into it. And Frodo McGee is just watching from the closet. Watching from the closet or the hole in the wall, whatever it was, sneaks out and stabs Phoebus. <laughs> like while just they're doing it? Yeah. Like before it happens, like while they're making out, he creeps out, stabs Phoebus. She faints and he okay. gets away. Yeah. <laughs> so she then gets blamed for Phoebus's murder and goes on trial for sorcery with her goat. With her goat. Because the goat knows things a goat shouldn't know. Goes there. The goat held the blade. <laughs> yes. What? So, so Phoebus is stabbed. They think he's dead, but he ends up being okay later. As they he gets hurt of, in the movie. They did that yeah, yeah, they yeah. they did that a little bit in the movie. Yeah, like, Frollo assumes kidding. he's dead, but he's not. Yeah. Esmeralda assumes he's dead. So she gets put on trial with her goat. She won't confess to murdering the man she she loves desperately. She didn't. But she didn't. Um, and they're like, okay, I guess we have to torture you. Because, you know, they've already decided that she's going to confess or they're going to claim demons. And it, there's no snow winning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Great. they bind her foot and they start pulling it. And she confesses because she's she can't handle it. And so she confesses to it and then Frollo comes and says he will save her if she is his. She remembers because she sees his face above Phoebus before he stabs yes! Phoebus. The cringy chapter was about him professing his love and telling her that she doesn't know torture like he knows torture because of these feelings he's had. And it's it's putting blame on her, putting blame on everyone else but himself and victim blaming. Yeah, it's really like it was really hard to listen to. He said like you don't know what I've suffered. He's just hitting all of the abusive traits. <laughs> Very much so. And it's basically like I will save you if you're mine. And she says no. <laughs> so good for you, man. Yep. So she goes to the gallows with her goat. With her goat. Uh, this is a couple months after the initial like trial because she go you know has to be in the cell and stuff. And Phoebus ends up like getting healed, coming back from the camp he was sent to to heal, and going back to his fiance, never clearing Esmeralda's name because he's not dead. She was tried for the murder of Phoebus, and the court just assumed he was dead, but he came back very alive. His fiance Ooh. is. This fiance's house is right by the square. Like you can see it. So he, they ended up seeing that it is Esmeralda getting hanged in the, the square. She yells for him and he just feigns ignorance and they disappear from the window. And wait, wait. Fiance is like, chill with that. Fiance is like, why is that woman screaming for you? Wait, well, she. That's fine. Yeah. She was jealous of her because in a previous chapter, they had called her over to have her dance for their group and saw that she was really beautiful and so she didn't like Esmeralda because she was pretty and Phoebus thought she was pretty and uh and they so just she, d she doesn't know that that Phoebus cheated on her no doesn't know the little bit of suspicion but doesn't really ask any questions they leave from the window and Phoebus ends up marrying her great great yeah. great may they both be yeah. happy yeah together yep so she it's about to get hanged in the gallows great. Mm -hmm. And Quasi mm -hmm. saves her. Okay. He does swing okay. down on a rope Ooh, and saves fun. her. And like the movie, okay, mm -hmm. like the movie, pulls her into Notre Dame and claims sanctuary. Oh, so that, that is beautiful. 
it's it's a beautiful moment in the book. And Esmeralda does go to the gallows twice. So that was the first time. Gets what saved girl? Notre Dame, has this awkward kind of friendship with Quasi, even though she can't stand to see his face. So there's not really a friendship. He just cares mm-hmm. for her because she was kind to him. Right, right. He gives her a whistle because it's one of the few things he can still hear in case she needs him. Ah. Oh, because she's living in like a cell in the bell tower and yeah, yeah. Um, and has to stay in there and all of that. And so Frollo finds out, because he didn't stay to watch her get hanged, finds out she's alive, comes to rape her in the bell tower and she blows the whistle and Quasi comes and drags Frollo off of her. Hell yeah. So there's that. Then he Hell realizes yeah. it's Frollo and... It has a knife, drops it because he won't, he's not going to hurt his, like he's in this weird, right, can't right, hurt right. his master trying to protect Esmeralda. So he basically says, if you're going to do anything, you have to kill me first. Doesn't actually try and stop Frollo, but is like, I'm going to be in between you. Right, right. Frollo is going to do it. And then Esmeralda gets the knife and points it at him and makes him go away. So this is a, the, another time that Frollo is coming to get her and Quasi tries to protect her. And then Frollo and her, the poet Gringoire, who was their husband, plot to get her out of Notre Dame to save her. Okay. Because there's going to be an order to come get her from the king. That's the only way you can get someone out of sanctuary. Because there has to be like an official order to pull them out of sanctuary. Otherwise, you're just protected by the church. Right, right, right. They get the Court of Miracles group to try and lay siege to Notre Dame to get her. So the people actually attacking Notre Dame in the book are the vagabonds. It's not okay. the guards, like in the movie. Mm-hmm. Quasi doesn't know what they're there for, can't hear them because he is oh, deaf, no. and starts throwing stones at them and the hot lead because they're attacking Notre Dame. And they think they're, well, of course, they're coming yeah. for Esmeralda. Right. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. So he's attacking them. Meanwhile, Gringois gets Esmeralda out while this is happening. And Frollo kind of takes her to a safe place and basically brings her in front of where the gallows are on their way and is like, again, choose me or the tomb. Again is giving her the ultimatum of death or choosing to be with me and love me. (laughs) Sir, sir, I don't know if you heard this Mm -hmm. the first 15 Mm -hmm. times you've tried to get her, but no! Mm -hmm. No means no! No means no. Does not get it. (laughs) She says, absolutely not. And I think it was it. He says the tomb or my bed is one of the lines in it. And she, I think right before that had said, it causes me less horror than you do. <laughs> so, you know, she stands, <laughs> yeah, up, it does. You know, she stands up for herself as best she can. He gives her over to a woman who hates gypsies. It's known as the recluse who ends up being Esmeralda's mom. Because she went crazy because she lost her daughter to right, the vagabonds. So there's reconciliation with her mom. So her amulet worked. But then the guards come and get her and she gets hanged. She gets hanged. And Quasi doesn't realize w- what happened to Esmeralda because during the fight he lost her because they came and got her. Sees too late that she is getting hanged. He sees Frollo in Notre Dame coming to watch it happen and then he follows Frollo realizes what's happened and then he uh, is completely distressed and throws Frollo off of the tower so Frollo is dead Esmeralda is dead oh that's Phoebus is married although that's yeah Frollo dies from falling off the the tower as well Quasi doesn't do it yeah Quasi doesn't do it in the film yeah he does it in the book wow that's that uh you know Mm -hmm. the this is very interesting because the last podcast we discussed a character where Disney included a lot of parts that did not age well mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And so it's very interesting to go to this movie. It really shows the growth of Disney that yeah. instead of leaning into those problematic issues, like with how they handled Esmeralda mm-hmm. in particular how they definitely modernized her and filled out her character in a much better way (laughs) they did while still throwing back to the original story it's not like it's totally wrong or anything but i would think that they improved that is my opinion (laughs) i do too i think because they decided to tell the narrative of man versus monster 
Mm -hmm. where Hugo was kind of telling a tragedy surrounding the crumbling building. Like it was kind of mirroring the crumbling Paris and Notre Dame. And in the movie, they decided to focus on the, I think, really important area of the man versus the monster and what justice is. And making such likable characters. I remember Mm -hmm. when I watched that movie, when it came out, I was six. So that'll age Mm -hmm. me even more. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I remember feeling, I, I mean, I didn't understand everything mm-hmm. that was happening in it because I was still quite young, but I felt very mature. I felt very like I am watching mm-hmm. a big kid movie mm-hmm. and I am enjoying it. Esmeralda is someone to look up to. The mm-hmm. relationships with people that she has is very well thought out. Mm-hmm. Phoebus, I think, is a great counterpart to her in that. Mm-hmm. And you see it grow. It spouts one of my favorite lines growing up of Phoebus, you you almost fight as good as a man. And she like fights back. Yep. <laughs> I was about to say the same thing to you. Oh yeah. Like, it's so yeah. You know? <laughs> it's really mm-hmm. fun and, and you appreciate their friendships and, and everything around Esmeralda. She's still this beautiful mm-hmm. creature, and she is very much for Frollo. Mm-hmm. a an object mm-hmm. like the original but i think the addition of god help the outcasts yes is just beautifully the music is beautiful the portrayal is beautiful mm-hmm. how they stylized it's brilliant it's beautiful <laughs> absolutely brilliant yeah, it's just, it's brilliant because it's it's someone who is written as a more pagan following Oh, I think I have the line that I know inspired God Help the Outcast because I just love that. So in Hugo's novel, it talks about her feeling hopeless when the Notre Dame is being seized and she goes down into a prayer and, and he says, For even if one believes in nothing, there are moments in life when one is always of the religion of the temple which is nearest at hand. Hmm. So she is in Notre Dame. When you feel yeah. hopeless, you just kind of give it up to fate, to right. whatever is there or not there, just to try <laughs> and get some help. Mm-hmm. I, I really feel like Disney captured a really wonderful version of her. It, yeah, she was very objectified in the novel. She was this pure virgin. It kind of sexualizes otherness because she was a Romani woman, right? Or supposedly a Romani woman, even though she was French in the novel. And that's something that has been a problem in a lot of stories: is the yeah. objectifying an otherness or making an ethnicity exotic. Right. It, and they, st- I mean, they still do it a little bit. Mm-hmm. They still do it in the, in the is, Disney I mean, movie. She is the character, like, that's her character. You can't you know? completely get rid of that. Right, right. They how do. old is she? Do you know how old she is in the movie? Because in the movie, she's definitely mm-hmm. drawn older than, I think, like, like I, the typical Disney femme, femme fatale. Yes, I think she's probably late coming. 20s. I don't know an exact. I don't know what they place her exact age at in the Disney movies, but she's definitely not under twenty. Like, yeah, it seems it feels like she's late twenties, early thirties. So it's a right. much older female love interest than mm-hmm. any of Disney's other characters. Oh, truly, she well, is. Well, Phoebus is older too. He's mm-hmm. he's not eighteen. Yeah, he's older. She's older. Quasi yeah. in the book is twenty. He's he's twenty in the movie too because mm-hmm. Frollo. Oh, that's right. Uses that. He he says something about this, like, for 20 years, I've been yeah. dealing with you. Yes. <laughs> like, and that's, come on, all sir. of these are older characters. And mm-hmm. they didn't make her naive in the... I guess we can switch to, like, what they did in the in the movie, because I've talked forever yeah. about the novel. And before we move on, I do want to talk about the word gypsy. And it oh, is, yes. Yes, 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 yes. It is something that is offensive to some Romani people. But I really feel like it is something that should probably get worked out of our language because it just mm-hmm. is originally a slur. It was a racial slur for Romani people. And it came from the word Egyptian because there was a false belief that the gypsies came from Egypt when in actuality... It's been traced back to northern India. So there's no actual connection to Egypt, but they were called that as a slang term for being from little Egypt. And I mean, they were horribly stereotyped as being dirty beggars and being hypersexual. It was used they do at, that um, in the Disney movie a bit. Yeah. Because of the stereotype of hypersexualization, there are different countries who would sterilize Romani women. There's this horrible history behind it. And 
it's just not something we need to use. No. Get a thesaurus. Like, I, right. find, a different, right. find a different word. It's just yeah. not. So I'm going to try to move into using Roma and Romani and the rest mm-hmm. of the podcast just to be aware of how many times they say it in the movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in 90, so it came out in 96. Mm-hmm. And this was the within the third wave of the kind of feminist movement, the, the girl power movement. You're starting to see changes of or wants of gender equality changes in the workplace there are more women working it's definitely pre me too though but women are getting married later so it, it's starting you can see that esmeralda is a product oh absolutely <laughs> of this movement 100 percent in a great way oh in a great way and that's what i remember her calling for justice yeah like that cry i remember and it just watching it this year has really rung Ooh. so much more powerful all the Black Lives Matter movements and we're starting to actually stop or at least acknowledging victim blaming after Mm -hmm. the Me Too movement and exposure. So it's been interesting to revisit this movie. And and for her to say it directly, it's very powerful for her to say it directly to Frollo's face. It wasn't her calling out to rouse the crowd. Phoebus does later, Mm -hmm. uh, which is still great. Thanks, Phoebus. Mm -hmm. However, (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's a little more powerful for her to say justice, to cut off Frollo and say it to his face. I think that's very powerful and reminiscent of this year and BLM and everything and all those images of people Mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. (laughs) Proving the point right there, you know. It struck me that so she in the movie, she goes up and gives him water and apologizes for even getting him into the contest because she didn't know this would happen. Right. She didn't realize when she first saw him. Mm -hmm. So she goes up to try and help him. And when Frollo tells her to go away, she says, yes, your honor. I'm just going to free this poor creature. She speaks to him in such a respectful way that I, I, it took me a second. I went, oh, like you're not just revolting back and like you're trying to do the right thing and you're doing it in Uh a respectful way. And then when he says, no, you can't, then she's like, absolutely not. Yes. And I like that she inspires Phoebus. Mm -hmm. And not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Not that Phoebus wasn't a good guy from the get go. Very early on, it's established that he is a man of good morals Mm -hmm. um, and everything. But after seeing her and the more interactions with her, he becomes more and more brazen with expressing his personal beliefs to Frollo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She does way more than he does up until the moment where he refuses to light the house on fire and then... Mm -hmm saves everyone inside. But I think it's very interesting and I like it a lot that she inspires him and not the other way around. Yeah, they both kind of save each other in this movie, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. I find her like he he calls sanctuary for her. Yep. She sword fights him. She with a candelabra. candelabra. Get out of here and holds her own. Like and she takes on an entire Oh yeah, she goes group one, of two, guards. Three, four, five, yeah, six. Oh, and one me. What will I do? Like, <laughs> we love looks, that. Uh, makes them look like idiots. Like she mm-hmm. just, she's smart. She's resourceful. She can hold her own. She disarms the captain of the guard. Fights yes! him with the candelabra. She's really amazing, and she does get saved by Quasi on different occasions, and she yes. does get saved by Phoebus. But then she, she you turns know, around and saves them too, though. Exactly, like, she jumps into the river. Good, the whole group dynamic, I think, goes through very realistic ups and downs. It is very understandable and very valid their feelings towards each other and mm-hmm. the tight group that they create by the end of it because they've mm-hmm. taken the time to build it. And build up those relationships and everything. And I think that's really... Yeah. We've talked about the fact that Phoebus and her really are built in attraction in this. She sees him and is immediately... The first interaction with them is him giving her coins. Mm -hmm. And then when the guards are trying to to take her, that he helps. The first thing that she sees of him is kindness. Mm Mm-hmm. Which and is, he takes the time, too, to give her coins mm-hmm. when people are turning. There's some, like, nasty comment that somebody yeah. makes yeah, yeah, about yeah. them, like, right before it. So it's nice. But you get that little moment of, ooh, they're pretty. But it's not mm-hmm. creepy. Yeah. Like, you, they have they have that. They have the amazing they're banter good. as they're sword oh fighting. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's just so good. It's just so good. And, and Phoebus is written so different than the novel. He's written as a very non-toxic man. Oh, he treats he treats 
Quasimodo? Frodo? Quasimodo. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he treats Quasimodo great too because yeah. he doesn't say anything about Quasi's looks mm-hmm. either. It's kind of nice because it's not just, oh, he's being nice to Esmeralda because she's pretty. He treats everybody the same mm-hmm. until you prove him otherwise. Yeah. I mean, he he treats Frollo with great respect until he goes too far. Sees that he shouldn't. <laughs> Yeah. So I I like that as a foil for our female protagonist instead of it just being a he's pretty or he saved me. So, yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's why I was really disappointed in the in the book, because it's she's obsessive about her love for him and he has done nothing but use her. Yeah. I was worried. I remember her dance being sexy in the movie, but it wasn't nearly as bad as I remember it. No, I don't know how you felt, but Mm -hmm. for me, the dancing itself, I don't think was sexy. I think it was fun. It was very fun spirited and whimsical. And she was definitely playing to the crowd Mm -hmm. like that. That felt very entertaining and energetic and great. I think what made it sexy Mm -hmm. was the shadowing. The I was about to say like the very shadowing of her body. The, like the highlights, like I don't know if she has like an eight pack or what, but there was like yeah, some ab highlights. That- and you already gave her, you know, a very pretty form fitting mm-hmm. lower cut dress, which I was fine with. It's not like she was like, she's an adult, out. you know, she, yeah, like, she's like, it was a very pretty dress. And they were really good at when she would do the, the jumps and the twirls and everything. Mm-hmm. You didn't see anything. But then they just like. Mm-hmm. Oh, not like just like almost crossed the border of like uncomfortable amounts of yeah of the there's like a co- yeah it was only for a section of it too i remember just thinking going like oh someone colored this really specifically yeah and i was like was that necessary like i don't know if that like we get this like yeah she she's drawn great like, yeah you know, like you don't need to shade yeah. it yeah like I, I i put what is the shading like and it was only that scene they didn't yeah. shade her like that in any and and she she does have her mm-hmm. under bust corset like mm-hmm. her top is low cut and open she's still drawn mm-hmm. a little more sexy than the traditional disney mm-hmm. lady but i never but, felt like mm-hmm. it was inappropriate in those moments it was just yeah. the dance that i was like what did you do yeah <laughs> she does like end up on a pole which was for the adults in the <laughs> the audience for that yep. like quick yep. second and they have a lot of eyeliner on her mm-hmm. they give her green eyes which is probably why i liked her because there wasn't very many characters with green eyes but in the book she has black eyes right so I found that really interesting that they gave her green eyes, too, because it's also green is associated with witchcraft and magic and mm-hmm. envy and all of that. So that was an interesting choice. And they did choose to make her actually Roma in this yes. rather than any yes. kind of backstory of her being anything else. I really enjoyed that mm-hmm. because when the Roma came up and like fought the guards at the end and it felt like they were taking themselves back and taking back mm-hmm their rights and everything. Whereas I think if they made her a white person mm-hmm. leading that, that I just... It wouldn't have aged nearly be, as well. No, it would be another white savior story. And Yeah. You know... They did it, cast Demi Moore. Uh, they did. I did find out that the supervising animator for Esmeralda was Tony Fusil. Fucil. I'm going to say that wrong and I apologize, Tony. But one of the things he did say about her is that he and he'd done Mufasa and Genie before as a supervising animator. So he he hadn't really done women supervising wise. But what was really hard is she has a lot of jewelry that has to move. When she, oh, my gosh. When and all dances. the skirts have mm-hmm. have the gold hanging off of them and everything. Oh, my gosh. But he just had a very, a very hard time of it with animating her. And there was a female supervising animator on Frollo. Which I is <laughs> like that. But I thought it was really interesting that it was Kathy Zelensky and the fact that he is one of the creepiest. I think he's the best villain. He's hands down the creepiest villain mm-hmm. and scarily enough, the most realistic villain. I think yes. most women can attest to meeting someone at some point in their life, at least a little bit like Frollo, which makes yeah. him disgusting <laughs> well, that's what i think i claim best villain not because he's the evilest which i probably is in my opinion but because he is a culmination of everything that is wrong in humans yes like he combines human flaw and there's no yeah. magical element to him no 
Oh, There's absolutely none. not. You've had like Jafar had magic, Ursula had magic, and she was a magic mm-hmm. like a sea witch. You've had Cinderella's mother wasn't magic, but magic existed in the world. This is kind of one well, of the and first times. Else about him too yep. is that he doesn't, which adds to what you're saying is. Mm-hmm. Lady Tremaine knew she was being a bad person. Mm-hmm. She, like, you know, <laughs> she chose. <laughs> she chose to be a bad person and knew that she was being terrible to, to Cinderella. Not only do a lot of the villains have magic, but they also know they're being evil. They know mm-hmm. Ursula knows that she is being evil. Whether you know they still think that their ideals are right, but they know that they are in the wrong in getting those things. Mm-hmm. Whereas Frollo doesn't he tr- mm-hmm. he is truly the umbrage mm-hmm. of disney movies because mm-hmm. he truly has no idea that he's in the wrong even in one of the creepiest drawn scenes which is hellfire he says it's not my fault i'm not to blame like yeah. he just does not own like that he's not righteous that he's not the correct moral compass no they set it up right at the beginning too mm-hmm. like the yeah Clopin they, they like really, set it up mm-hmm. I love Clopin's character. And he sets up in the beginning the actual question that will be talked about. The who is a monster and who is the man. He tells kids what we're going to learn about today. And then we learn Mm -hmm. about it. And he poses it again at the end. And it's just such a powerful question. Quasi is much more innocent and... He's pretty innocent in the novel, too, but he does attack her at one point. So he mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's a little bit different. We, oh, we meet yeah. him helping a bird learn to fly. Right, like, right. You know, it's, <laughs> you just love him. And what I think they did really well was also his relationship with her, mm-hmm. even when he his heart is broken. And he rips that little heart card, yeah, which just breaks you. Everyone's because felt he's that. Aces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, he's. But you know what he doesn't say? Mm-hmm. He doesn't say friend zone no he doesn't he does because she never led him on that's what like no. she, you don't see her lead him on and like he it's... doesn't he understands that he is not mm-hmm. like that they are friends both sides of mm-hmm. this friendship mm-hmm. there's no crying wolf on either side a moment that really touched me when i watched it again was when they're both sitting at the top of notre dame and he's showing her the city and he says that gypsies are evil but she isn't and that he's a monster and she asked who told you that and it was frollo and she instead of getting mad at him tries to show him that he's not a monster with the palm reading but Mm -hmm. teaches him that his prejudices are prejudices it's such a beautiful moment because she could have very quickly gotten very defensive oh yeah she sees that he has just been told and taught the ignorant stereotypes and it was just so beautiful because i think we're still in a place in our world unfortunately where we're still trying to teach people of the prejudices that they hold right it's a little moment like there's no monster line like that's just no yeah (laughs) it's not just about her she makes it about him loving himself right right you know well i have a question for you about um (laughs) <laughs> go i've been talking Esmeralda. so much what, oh no you're good I, uh, give me all the things because yeah you you did you did all the research for this one so that <laughs> that's good so i know we've talked about her relationships with different characters mm-hmm. and so i know they are not in the second movie as much mm-hmm. and the second movie is not as well known mm-hmm. but how did you feel about esmeralda's relationships with phoebus Mm-hmm. and the rest of the cast in the second one. How do you how do you feel about that? How did that go? I I had never seen the second one, which is a shame on me. I thought I didn't think she was in it. Oh, um, same. <laughs> but there's a really nice relationship with it's a couple of years later and you see them have a kid, a, a cute little blonde little brat. And I love him. And <laughs> you see Phoebus and Esmeralda unashamedly love each other. Like that they want to shout it from the hill. Like it's just so nice to see two people and she still calls him on his crap when he Mm -hmm. starts judging the circus people. You see her make that like, oh, like you thought my people were like that. Yeah. You still have that banter. You still have that. And all the original cast came back. I felt like her, she became the confidant and kind of like almost a mage-like character to quasi when he needed help she really yeah, they're still close and still good friends it's, yeah they're very good friends and you can just see that it's a mutual love of friendship love for each other that she really yeah. wants the best for him that she wants him not to be alone even though he's feeling alone 
I just thought mm-hmm. they did a really wonderful job of them being in love and not comp- like yeah. it wasn't about that. It's not about the original characters having complicated no drama. It's not about the love triangle anymore. It, there's nope. no there's hardly any of that in the first one too. Like there's a little right. bit of it when they have to work together. Right, right. <laughs> but both of them and they work through it. It's it's fun to, to visually see them work through it. And Phoebus is very understanding mm-hmm. of uh, Quasi's feelings and stuff. Like they they cover it very well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the second one is is very wholesome was that similar to what you when you watched it was your reaction to it yeah a hundred percent i i thought that was really nice and gratifying and it was nice to just see two people mm-hmm. in love yeah and, and not they're in love under trauma or mm-hmm. under duress or because of some crazy thing and they're not forced together like they literally are just a happy married couple who still jab each other for yep. fun yeah <laughs> and run around chasing their kid and still have their friends and have their lives. Mm-hmm. It's they both their own people still. So that was very fun. And, it's, you know, the story does focus mainly on, on Quasi as it should. But it was nice to see that very comfortable relationship grow. It was just so cute. Like yeah. it, it was, you know, you can tell that they spent less time on it and that they did less oh, sound absolutely. mixing. There was, you know, the, the score was uh, like it was. The animation started and I watched them back to back. Yeah. Mm. So I like mm-hmm. finish the first one and then start the second one went, ah. Yes. Yes. The budget was very different for this one. <laughs> Going straight to the DVD or the VHS, wherever they were at that time. Yes. I, think was, I think it was 2002, maybe. I think that's what it released. Yeah. And that would have been the same year Returned to Neverland happened. So that's kind of interesting that both of the hmm. sequels came out around the, the same time that yeah. we've covered. But, you know, you had all your characters in it. Mm-hmm. And you really do see at the end of the first movie, you see Quasi and Phoebus come together. Yes. And under because he Phoebus does save him. I do not believe the physics of Esmeralda holding up Quasimodo no. and Frollo off the side of a building. No, no. that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but it does not make any sense. Um no. You know. <laughs> but then Phoebus <laughs> catching him falling like 20 feet. Yeah. Physics yeah, don't really but, match up. No, <laughs> but they're, they're both very caring of each other. Even, yeah. even, I mean, after the initial, like, he's angry because he thinks that Phoebus is coming to get Esmeralda that, that mm-hmm. first initial time. But anytime after that, they both, like, when she hugs Phoebus mm-hmm. after she helps free them and Phoebus, she, like, yeah, she runs up and hugs him. And what I like about it is because I don't think she he was just there first. Like, yeah. like I think she would she's gonna hug both of them, you know. Yeah. But I like that he was the one to break it and be like, ah nah, it was all his Yeah. That I, I really liked that for his character. And then vice versa, that quasi you saw him a little hurt, mm-hmm. but he wasn't like Oh, how dare you? Yeah, like, he doesn't. You know? He doesn't try to get revenge. He doesn't no. get like it's. He he feels those feelings that he absolutely mm-hmm. is allowed to feel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then they move on from it, and it and he joins their hands at the end. Yeah. Oh, when Esmeralda, I, I forgot about the shot at the end where she reaches for the camera to take Quasi's hand and lead him out at the very end, yeah. and it was just beautiful. I mean, the image of her being held up as like this martyred figure in the white mm-hmm. the, stunning i i love that they broke down to everybody was the same by the end mm-hmm. because the end you had esmeralda was in all white mm-hmm. and rags you had phoebus mm-hmm. was in all white rags mm-hmm. you had and then quasi as as well was just mm-hmm. in his typical like rags. tunic so, and yeah right so you had these these three very different people mm-hmm. these outcasts that have united and it it doesn't matter who they are on the outside because on the inside they're all Mm -hmm. the same they're all very good people yeah and it's it's really it's really connecting and the fact that esmeralda's injustice done to her inspires the revolt of the people on the guards Mm -hmm. because it is so clear that the because frollo's a judge in it and then you have Mm -hmm. everyone who is a guard other than phoebus is the ones who instigate the injustices in it Uh uh-huh like the guards Uh are the ones who start throwing fruit Yep. At Quasi, I w- as soon as I'm like, oh, they start it. It is the guards. That's also very interesting mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for this year mm-hmm. or this past the past year the the twenty. Yeah, I know year. Yeah, it just it hit me when this I is saw a very it. relevant movie. It's a very relevant <laughs> movie, and this came out in '96. So it, I think it aged in a way they probably weren't expecting. She was always someone that I loved, and as a kid, I think I loved her because she was so smart. 
and that you saw her sword fight and throw helmets Ugh. to attack guards. And, yes. you know, she had this cute little goat. That was funny. You just wanted to be her, she you did. know? She was so strong and brave and exciting and and, and then she gets the God help the outcast moment. Like, yes. you see her be this very strong mm-hmm character like the stereotype strong opinionated woman but then she has this moment of i don't know what to do i was listening to god help the outcast because it's it's a great song but i i very specifically noticed that when she right before she says i ask for nothing Mm -hmm. the the chorus the chorus is a bunch of white people walking around saying i ask for wealth i asked for very well dressed white people Mm -hmm. so it's all of these clearly well off characters asking for money asking for fame asking for love Mm -hmm. and this no shoes traveling dancer says i ask for nothing i can get by so it's just this huge perspective in your Mm -hmm. face I never I know that that section and I always knew I asked for nothing. and it's this beautiful big like belt I ask for nothing but yeah. it struck me that it's just this group of well-dressed white people begging for things mm-hmm. they don't need mm-hmm. and it just mm-hmm. like hit me so so much harder as an adult and it's things like that that makes me love this movie because as a child I think I loved her independence and I loved her confidence mm-hmm. and as a teenager mm-hmm. I think I loved her relationships and as an adult I really love the way they've crafted her sense of justice and yeah. and Frollo just gets creepier and creepier the older you get yes yes <laughs> yes and that's when you get the like I've seen I've seen you before at a bar and yeah. I hate that like ugh. yeah it's <sighs> That's One thing I, I wanted to, to yes. mention real quick to add on to your song yes. is not only are these the the wealthy, well-dressed white people, but they're also singing in front of others mm-hmm. in the chapel to the beautiful parts of the chapel. Mm-hmm. Whereas she is a moment alone, sometimes looking out over the city, walking down the halls, having a truly internalized moment of what she's she's feeling. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if the other wealthier people are, are it's for show. Yeah. <laughs> like in some parts, they're like, look at me praying, give me things. Yes. It's just a really well storyboarded. A yeah. lot of the numbers are just really well staged and that can be hard to find sometimes. And it, it just is such a good number because it's not, it's someone who isn't religious. And right. I never felt like it was trying to be preachy. Like it right. just, it just felt like you're in a place where someone's got to be out there or something like just, I don't, like right. I can't do anything now. It's just a kind of a sign of helplessness that I think we've all felt too. Oh, it's yeah. very yeah, yeah, yeah. relevant and very easy to connect to. And they use all this church imagery, but they did a good job at not making it a religious movie. No. Which is probably pretty hard to to yeah. not do. Yeah, when you're to talking be in about Notre, it. Notre Dame. Yeah, like, you have the bishop. The, the bishop yeah. is done really well there. Mm-hmm. Like he has a, all those qualities, and mm-hmm. and it's done. Yeah, really well. I, I think Esmeralda would fit in really well in our time period. Yes, I think she would be fantastic. Yeah, and I think this movie, when it comes to women and Esmeralda as a woman mm-hmm. to look up to, like you had mentioned earlier, I think you can have different takeaways from her, positive takeaways from her mm-hmm. for many different ages as you mm-hmm. watch it. So yeah, she's a big fan. Big I'm fan. A, yeah, I'm a big fan still. We still got to get Gypsy out of our language. She's still an object and a love yep. interest is the story. Like Her main plot point is to be a love interest, but they give her so much more depth yes. and agency in this version compared to the 16-year-old mm-hmm. naive creature that she is in the, in the novel. So I really think they did a good job. There's There's right. been so many versions of this tale. This particular movie got turned into the Broadway show that made a lot of changes. And they've had countless movie adaptations of this. And I think it really is people connecting to, to being an outcast or being unwanted or feeling ugly and seeing injustice happen. I feel like a lot of people connect to that. And we get this character who stands up for herself and stands up for her yes. people. I'm really happy that this movie came out when it did because I kind of got to have that character growing up. Yes, I agree. I hope that it still gets shown. It is very adult. Yeah, it's mature. It's very still, mature. Still done in a way that kids won't see it. Like I think the mm-hmm. the battle scene, how it is drawn 
very scary. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of silly moments. You have one of the sculptures. <laughs> da-da, 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 fly my yes. bridges. You know, you have <laughs> with the pigeons. So you have yes. some like silly moments in there. Like, is that how that's supposed to work? Works for me. Yep. You know, you have these silly moments in there. And then Frollo's whole thing, his song is is very creepy as an adult, but mm-hmm. I think as a child, it reads as just scary. Just villain. Like he he wants her. But yeah, it is definitely more mature. It's complex. It's not a bad thing. No, it's not a bad thing. I think kids can handle a lot more than sometimes we might think. There's so much. We haven't even really dug into some of the other things I love about the movie. I always like having fun facts. So here's my fun fact about... uh, We had the pixie dust last time. This isn't as as funny, I think, as that. But there were 72,000 pencils used to make this film. How specific? Who oh, yeah. It was on the, it was on the making was of... There's a, there's a cute, of yeah, there's a cute making of the Hunchback series that you can watch on YouTube. And it, it has some background stuff and it talks about there's 72,000 pencils were used on it. And this was the first Disney animated movie that had a post credit scene. It's very short, mm. but it's just the gargoyle Hugo, who is yeah. Jason Alexander saying goodbye, but it it was the first use of a post credit scene in an animated And now Walt that's Disney. a staple. It's a that's thing. Like a Disney, a Disney Marvel staple now is to you sit and wait through the credits to see what's mm-hmm. what little tidbit you're going to get next. How fun. Yeah, that's my little fun fact <laughs> for today. I like it. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. Yes. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Damsels in Dialogue. Tune in next week as we find ourselves on the beautiful island of Hawaii and put the spotlight on the hardworking Nani and the effects of a little alien intruder on her family. If you enjoyed listening today, we'd love to have you subscribe to this podcast and share with friends. If you really enjoyed our discussion, you can find more behind the scenes content, a peek at our research notes, and even entire bonus episodes on Patreon. Each month, we release a full After Hours episode where we discuss the movies we cover in each episode unfiltered and unrestrained along with the behind the scenes extras and notes. You can reach us on social media. Links to all our platforms can be found in our About section. Until next time, this has been Damsels in Dialogue. Have a nice day. This podcast is sponsored by Royal Princess Parties, LLC, and is produced by Hello Out There Audio, part of Hello Out There Productions. (laughs) 